Do you know what a magnet is? Like a fridge magnet. Have you ever seen one of those before? Maybe you used to have lots of these when you were a wee little laddie. You've seen magnets before in your day-to-day -day life, but have we mentioned anything so far that's directly relevant to your real life experience with magnets? Not exactly. So I want to make up for that with this lesson. Our question to answer in this lesson is, what do magnets, like the fridge magnets or other kinds of magnets, what do magnets have to do with the magnetic field? We have all the intuition down for magnetic fields, so now all we have to do is link it to magnets in the real world. Let's consider a normal bar magnet. Bar magnets always have a north pole and a south pole. What do these mean? You might have been taught in grade school that when you have magnets with opposite poles close to each other like this, they attract one another. And when like poles are close to each other, they repel. Why does that happen? To understand how that works, we need to start by thinking back to our current wires next to each other. Do you remember how electric currents going in the same direction attract each other and currents with opposite directions repel each other? Well, we're actually allowed to extend this idea from straight wires to circular loops. If we have current loops that are flowing in the same direction, they'll attract one another as well. And current loops going in the opposite direction will repel one another. But do you also remember that we can sort of call a current loop a magnetic dipole? In other words, a current loop is just an entity that has its own magnetic dipole moment. Now that's kind of a loaded phrase there, magnetic dipole. Let's think about that for a second. Dipole just means two poles, so it's like we're saying two-pole magnet. How does it make sense to call a current loop something like a two-pole magnet? It turns out we can actually say that a current loop is a magnet. A very weak one, of course, but still technically a magnet. When we see two bar magnets attracting each other when their poles point in the same direction, it's exactly the same set of physics at play when two current loops attract each other when their currents are going in the same direction. And of course the same is true with the opposite directions. It can make sense to think about a current loop as a magnetic dipole in that it has a north pole, the pole from which magnetic field lines exit from, and a south pole, the pole into which magnetic field lines enter. And that stays consistent no matter how our current loop is oriented in space, as long as the current within the loop itself stays consistent. Do we remember something else that creates a somewhat similar looking magnetic field distribution? Solenoids. And in fact, a solenoid is also a magnet. A solenoid is a magnet in the sense that it has a magnetic north pole where field lines emerge from, and a magnetic south pole where they circle back into. So with all that established, a bar magnet is what's called a permanent magnet. Permanent magnets generate a magnetic field distribution in space similar to that of a solenoid or a current loop, but without any external current actually flowing. Remember with the other two, we actually need some current to be flowing, otherwise there's no charge movement and no charge movement means there's nothing to generate any magnetic field in the first place. Then how is a bar magnet possible? Didn't we already establish that magnetic fields can only be generated by moving charges or electric current? That's true, but did you forget that the atoms within our magnet contain moving charges themselves? Namely, each atom's got its own set of electrons buzzing around it like honeybees. Imagine we have an electron orbiting the positive nucleus of the atom like this. We're massively oversimplifying here. Just a quick look at the periodic table shows us that any atom that would actually make up a magnet would have to have more than a single electron, but let's just keep things simple here. The electron creating the orbit is a lot like a current loop, isn't it? After all, a circular current loop contains electric current or charge traveling in an orbit, and that charge flow or current generates a magnetic field. We can think of the electron orbit, a single charge moving in a loop, as doing the same sort of thing. Now of course, once we get down to the atomic level, we're really dealing with quantum mechanics and not classical mechanics anymore, so electrons don't actually twirl around the atom in a Newtonian orbit like this. They're doing something else entirely. But even though it's completely wrong, the model is surprisingly useful in giving us insights into how magnetic fields are produced by atoms in the real world. The electron orbit here functions just like a current loop in that it too is really just a magnetic dipole moment at the end of the day. And this brings us to a fact that's true whether we're dealing with quantum mechanics or not. Every atom 
has some net magnetic dipole moment. A magnetic dipole moment generates a magnetic field in space. Therefore, if you follow my logic, every atom generates a magnetic field in space. Of course, atoms are really, really small, so in your average material, the magnetic dipole moments are randomly oriented in all sorts of directions, so the magnetic field generated by each one individually would be pitiful, and the sum of these randomly oriented magnetic dipole moments wouldn't amount to much at all. But when they all team up together in the same direction, there's strength in numbers, and nothing can stop them. What we see here, where the magnetic dipole moments in the metal are completely aligned, or at least mostly aligned enough to generate a magnetic field without the presence of an external current source, this is called ferromagnetism. And the material we're looking at is a ferromagnetic material, or a permanent magnet in other words. The magnetic dipole moments within the material generate magnetic fields that persist, and then those magnetic fields can help the magnet indirectly attract other ferromagnetic materials, like paper clips and nails, things like that. So ferromagnetism is one form of magnetism. In a ferromagnetic material, domains full of magnetic dipoles can be randomly oriented and not really lead to any real net magnetic dipole moment. But when we introduce the material to an external magnetic field, the domain boundaries shift to produce a net magnetic dipole moment in the direction of the magnetic field, kind of in the same way that a magnetic field produces a torque on a magnetic dipole, causing it to oscillate toward the magnetic field direction. Then if we take away the magnetic field, that dipole moment persists to some extent, and we're left with a permanent magnet. So that's ferromagnetism. Now always remember, when we're talking about these magnetic dipole moments, we're really just referring to atoms here. Each atom has its own set of electrons buzzing around, creating many current loops, so the atom itself is a magnetic dipole. There are two other forms of magnetism we're sometimes concerned about at the intro level, and they're called paramagnetism and diamagnetism. With paramagnetism, there are no domains like there are in ferromagnetism. In other words, there are no mini groups of dipoles pointing in the same direction. Instead, you just have randomly oriented dipoles, and in the presence of an external magnetic field, those dipoles will tend to align in the direction of the magnetic field. The difference between this and ferromagnetism, though, is that with paramagnetism, if we take away the external magnetic field, the dipoles just go back to their random orientations from before. They don't persist. With diamagnetism, it's almost the same story, except in the presence of an external magnetic field, the dipoles tend to align opposite the direction of the magnetic field. How is that possible? Didn't we see that magnetic dipoles in an external magnetic field have a tendency to move towards the magnetic field? Yes, that's true, but paramagnetism and diamagnetism can't be completely explained with classical electromagnetism. They're actually quantum mechanical effects, so I won't say too much more about them here. The theory gets pretty complicated pretty fast, involving things like quantum spin. In any event, paramagnetism and diamagnetism are usually too weak to be seen in day-to-day -day life anyway and are normally observed in laboratories with highly sensitive equipment. What we see in daily life is almost always ferromagnetism. So back to bar magnets, there's one last thing I want to discuss, and that's compasses. Now that we've got all the theory out of the way, a compass is just a ferromagnetic needle, really just a tiny bar magnet that's very lightweight, so it can pivot easily and always point in the geographic north direction. How does it know to point in the northwards direction? When we have a bar magnet in an external magnetic field, that bar magnet acts like a magnetic dipole, so it wants to orient itself in the direction of the magnetic field as we saw before. So the only reason our compass needles always know to point north would be if there were some external magnetic field that somehow always pointed north as well. Indeed, the Earth is just one giant magnet, and a bit confusingly, the geographic north pole of the Earth meaning where Santa Claus lives, is very, very close to the magnetic south pole of the Earth. And the geographic south pole of the Earth near Antarctica, that's very close to the magnetic north pole of the Earth. So the magnetic field lines that extend out of the Earth come from the Earth's magnetic north pole near Antarctica and circulate all the way to the Earth's magnetic south pole in the Arctic Ocean. Why does the Earth behave like a magnet? Honestly, we don't really know for sure. It's actually an active area of research. 
But in any event, that's why compass needles point in the northward direction. The Earth creates a magnetic field that points very close to pure north, provided you're not really close to the Arctic or Antarctic regions. So magnetic compass needles align themselves to point in the same direction as this external field, in the same way that a magnetic dipole tries to align itself with an external magnetic field.